Friends, we shared some COVID-related updates in the weekly messenger earlier this week. I encourage you to check that out. Uh, it's also on our website if you have not had a chance to see it. Our reopening task force has reviewed some updated guidelines from our presbytery and uh, are thankful for those as we continue to monitor the situation and make adjustments accordingly. You may have noticed um, a much welcome return of pew cushions, especially those sitting here in the sanctuary this morning. I'm seeing the nodding of heads, as well as Bibles that are back in the sanctuary as of last week. We hope these are small steps that will be reminders of all the progress that we have made up to this point as we look forward to a further easing of limitations as it is safe to do so. Our task force and session continue to meet regularly and we will keep you posted on further updates in the days to come. So in the meantime, let's all lean on the fruits of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives us. Things like patience and kindness and love and compassion and joy. And lastly, somebody asked me this recently, so I want to make sure everybody knows this. Yes, you can sign up for worship on Sunday morning. We tried that out this past Sunday just to be sure. Uh, not that anybody here would ever wake up on Sunday morning and think, oh, I forgot to sign up. And certainly that was not my lovely wife. <laughs> She's not here, I can say that. So while I don't recommend anybody wait that late to register, just know that that is an option if you need it. And now let us pray for illumination. Holy God, speak to us what has been told from the beginning, that your word is the foundation of the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Today we're hearing a story from Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 39. This is very early on in Jesus' public ministry. After leaving the synagogue, Jesus, James, and John went home with Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed, sick with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her. And she served them. That evening at sunset, people brought to Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town gathered near their door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases, and he threw out many demons. But he didn't let the demons speak, because they recognized him. Early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. Simon and those with him tracked him down. When they found him, they told him, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so that I can preach there too. That's why I've come. And he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and throwing out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes, if you take your Bible and listen real close, you can hear the disciples talking in Mark's gospel. Did you know this? It's true. Their words eke out between the verses. They may not be written down, but the words are there all right. And you know what? I think I can just make out what the disciples are saying at this very moment of Jesus' ministry. All right, listen up. Ladies and gentlemen, our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. Average foot speed over uneven ground, barring injuries, is four miles an hour. That gives us a radius of six miles. What I want from each and every one of you is a hard target search. 
of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, and dog house in that area. Checkpoints go up at 15 miles. Your fugitive's name is one Jesus Christ. Let's go get him. Now what? <laughs> Okay, you know what? I may have the disciples confused for Tommy Lee Jones when he played a U.S. Marshal in the 1993 movie, The Fugitive. But there is a similar situation unfolding here in Mark's gospel. So let's recap the whirlwind of a day that Jesus has just had. And bear in mind that we are still in chapter 1 of Mark. Jesus' ministry has only just gotten started. And already he has been baptized by John, spent 40 days in the wilderness, and called his first disciples. But in just the last 24 hours, Jesus has thrown out a demon in the synagogue. Immediately after that astonishing miracle, we pick up with our reading for today. When Jesus goes to Simon's house, and heals his mother-in-law of a fever. And that same evening, word has already spread about the miraculous Jesus. And as Mark tells it, the whole town gathered near the door around sunset, bringing people to Jesus to be healed. How long do you imagine it took for Jesus to heal all of those folks? I can only guess that his work lasted well into the night. And if we were in that situation, we might be tempted to sleep in a little bit the next morning and catch our breath. But Jesus, early in the morning, well before sunrise, as Mark tells us, rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. Sometimes there's so much action surrounding Jesus' ministry that we gloss over that detail. Jesus, in the midst of his new and wildly popular ministry, takes time to get away by himself and pray. Perhaps there is a lesson in there somewhere that Jesus views prayer and quiet reflection as vital to his ministry. But before we're even given a chance to think about that, this quiet lesson promptly gets interrupted. The disciples have made a horrifying discovery. Jesus is on the run. The Lamb of God is on the Lamb. Sorry, I couldn't resist. And so, deputizing themselves into the marshal's service, the disciples begin their manhunt. Maybe that sounds like a bit of a reach to you. The translation we heard a few moments ago simply said, Simon and those with him tracked him down. That's such a gentle way of putting it. It sounds like Jesus just lost track of time on his prayer walk. But that translation is a little too gentle if you ask me. The verb for tracked down is actually a very strong, hostile action more akin to hunting down prey or an adversary or even, you might say, a fugitive. Now that's a bold choice for these newly recruited disciples to make. Only a couple of days on the job and already they think they know what their master needs to be doing right now. He can't be out lollygagging in the desert all by himself. Mark says, when they found him, they told him, everyone's looking for you. Deputy Marshal Simon, along with deputies Andrew, James, and John, think it's their job to get Jesus' ministry back on track. There's a whole town back there that still needs a lot of preaching and healing. And with their master in custody, they can finally get back to what's important before they lose any more time. But before they can slap the handcuffs on, 
Jesus turns the tables on their little maneuver. In fact, his response probably knocked the aviators right off their faces. Jesus replied, Let's head in the other direction, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there too. That's why I've come. I wonder if we recognize the significance of this moment. For the first time, but unfortunately not the last, the disciples tell Jesus what they expect him to do, rather than listening to Jesus' will for his own ministry. They've learned just enough about Jesus to get them in trouble. They've witnessed him preaching and healing for the first time, and their expectation is that he will keep doing that until every last person in that town has received and been healed by the good news from Christ himself. Only then should he move on to the next place. But Jesus tells his disciples that this is not why he's come. His ministry will not be confined by people's expectations of success. He's called to proclaim the gospel in word and deed all across the kingdom of God. And that means this town doesn't get Jesus all to themselves. There are other people. Other flocks that need to hear from Jesus too. So perhaps after all that talk about sharing the gospel with others, the disciples should be willing to share Jesus too. And there's something else here as well. Because Jesus' ministry must constantly be on the move to reach new people. That tells us that Jesus does not expect for his ministry To heal 100% of the people of every illness under the sun all in one day. Healing all of us of everything that ails us on this side of heaven is not the goal. Instead, healing is a sign, a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven will bring. And deep down, we know this, don't we? We know that believing in the gospel doesn't bring an end to our suffering or anyone else's at the drop of a hat. Christ, the great physician, heals us of our sin. And what that does is enable us to endure the suffering that inevitably comes in life. Why else would Jesus prepare us for the painful parts of life with the Beatitudes? Here's a snippet as Luke records them. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you, On account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Deep down, we know this. Christ did not promise us an easy life, a perfectly healthy and whole life without challenges and obstacles along the way. The promise lies in what's coming. I think the disciples missed the forest for the trees that day. They saw the miracle of healing as an end to itself, rather than an example of what the kingdom will be like. And as a result, they placed their expectations on Jesus to heal everyone and everything right now. We can bring heaven to earth today if Jesus will just do what we want. Perhaps we've made the same mistake as the disciples. We come to Jesus and demand, I need you to fix this, heal that on my schedule, 
when it's convenient for me. And like the disciples, we think we know what Jesus is supposed to be doing. And when Jesus doesn't answer our summons, we're ready to call in the marshals. Maybe this is the perfect story for the first chapter of Mark. Let's get it all out of the way right up front. Jesus is not under our control. And thinking that only gets disciples into trouble. So before we call in the cavalry, let's take a moment to let Jesus explain himself. Jesus' ministry is one that is always on the move, taking a message of healing and wholeness to new people and new places. As Jesus' followers, we carry that same message of healing and wholeness. And Mark makes it plain for us what we're supposed to do next. Go and do likewise with other towns, with other people. Because there's no pair of handcuffs strong enough to keep Jesus all to ourselves. Let us pray. God, you call us to follow rather than lead, to serve rather than be served, to go even when we feel content right where we are, Free us of the expectations we try to place on you so that beyond the miracle of healing, we can see the greater miracle that you invite us to be part of your kingdom-building work. In the name of the tireless and prayerful one, Jesus Christ, amen.